Kid, seriously. Well, hey, we have finally made it. Episode 8, the last episode of Season 3, True Detective. It came out two nights ago. We're a little late, but we both love the Oscar. So first off, congratulations. You won the family Oscar pool, Mark. First time in 26 years. It's got to be a... Didn't I I get least tie once? I guess I I normally just remember me winning all the time, so I, I get lost in what happened with other people. But if you tied once, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's a big night for me. Nice, nice. And you got to do it in a year where a quality movie like Green Book won. But a good night for uh, Mahersha Ali. He picks up an Oscar for a so-so movie. And we also get the final episode of True Detective. So this is an all-spoiler review. We're not going to bother with anything non-spoiler. If you haven't watched it, turn us off now and come back later and check it out. So let's jump into this because this was not the episode I was expecting, and I don't think it was the episode that a lot of people were expecting. We found out very early what happened to Julie for the most part as far as the criminal aspect of what happened to Julie with her being kidnapped, much as our good friend Smithers predicted a few episodes ago and you summed up last episode. She was abducted by the Hoyt family daughter and the one-eyed man, Watts, who was kind of watching out for her. Then we get uh, we get that pretty quick throughout the episode. We did not have an old man fight like we thought we might or were worried we might have. And then we get a happy ending, basically, for our characters as we learn exactly why some of the things happened, why Hayes was suspended after 1980, what happened to him after 91, and where he kind of ends up now. And we actually get a little bit of a, a nice deal for Stephen Dwarf on, on why he is the way he is. So it was an interesting ending. It was completely unexpected. Mark, did this ending, did this episode work for you? The episode did not work for me for a couple reasons. One, first off, the whole Peter Jackson, Return of the King, five different fake endings strung out before the real ending uh, was really annoying to me. Uh, they, they're just constantly having these scenes that would serve as an ending, then another one comes along, and I, I was really starting to get upset with that, even though the absolute last one, which is was just of Hayes in the Jungle, back in Vietnam um, and him disappearing into the shadows as the camera kind of pans out was, I thought that was perfect. Um, I just wish that they had maybe moved that up 10 minutes or so. Interesting. Um, Cause I, I, that never occurred to me. I, I have some problems with how this episode played out, but I guess I didn't, I didn't see it that way. So that, that's an interesting take. And now that you say it out loud, I can see how you would come to that, but uh, I didn't run into that problem personally. Yeah. Well, good for you also it was really exposition heavy you show don't tell and this episode was almost all as far as the mystery goes which is kind of the central premise we all buy into the show for it was all just tell first off it was you know stephen williams um watts telling everything at that dining room table and then later on it was um amelia telling Hayes everything in that sort of, you know, weird hallucination dream sequence that he had. Now, now let's start with the Watts encounter so we can kind of move through this a little chronologically because I also had a bit of issue with that. Not only the fact that he just sits down and tells everyone what's going on, and they they gave him some motivation that I, I could believe, but I had two problems with this. The first is just the style of how it was done, which is kind of my problem with this whole episode. I don't have a problem on paper with how you would summarize how these character arcs were wrapped up. But I have a problem with the way they were presented in the context of that episode. You're right. It was monologue. It actually reminded me of murder. She wrote where at the end, Angela Lansbury explains exactly what happened in the crime while they cut away to reenactments of the crime as they happened. That's exactly what Watts did in there. And it it took me out of it a little because it seemed cheesy to me. And The thing about Watts is I think that was a good performance there, but I left that scene going, well, why didn't we spend time with this guy? This guy is a really interesting character, probably more interesting than a lot of people that we spent time with. And now I feel cheated that he's basically 
been not used until this one monologue at the end so they can kind of dump everything from the crime angle and then move on to more of the the character arc so that one yeah. that one rubbed me the wrong way yeah and i and i think too it's that you know part of the problem with that monologue too is that it reveals ultimately how sort of slight the mystery was and the fact that they dragged it out over eight episodes when it, the, the crime at the center of it wasn't that complicated, which I'm actually fine with. And that gets to it later to something that I, I did like about this. But, you know, there's the second you define something, it stops being scary or spooky. The second you give it dimension and to have him just sit down and lay out the whole thing, it pulls all the mystery out of it. If I'm going to go back and rewatch this now, I'm going to have the mystery pulled completely out of it because there's no ambiguity. There's no room for doubt. There's no unknown there. They just laid it all out for us. And, and I feel like that that's really going, it really hampered my enjoyment of this episode and well it's going to hamper my ability to enjoy it under rewatch that's that's interesting because i think i have the opposite take where because i to me that what they're telling us with how we found this out very early on in the episode and how they almost teased us because you have that they have that opening encounter in the woods with with mr hoyt and you know it's kind of setting up for this oh it's these big forces against each other and then they kind of throw that aside and be like, no, it's actually a very simple crime. And these are actually kind of simple, simplistic people. There isn't a lot to it. It's not a giant conspiracy. It's not the the governor of Louisiana being involved, you know, Reverend Tuttle, all that other stuff that we saw in season one. It, it is a really simplistic thing. And it's to me how they then move into the second half of this episode, which is wrapping up the character arcs and really talking about their motivations for being so stuck on this case and how being stuck on this case has affected their lives and relationships with other people. To me, the fact that it's a simplistic crime just emphasizes their their kind of descent I- into a little bit of madness as they, they hunt after this. And so for me, I actually... I actually find that aspect of a rewarding and it goes back to what I, I alluded at a lot of these things. If you told me how they were going to wrap up on paper, I go, I'm on board. This is awesome. The way they pulled it off in the show didn't like as much. Yeah. Well, that gets to what I was going to say about the thing I liked is I actually did like that. Okay. If you're going to do the crime, have it be a simple one. And it, it felt as a little bit of a, of a snark at all these people with their elaborate conspiracy theories about the governor and the yellow King and tying back to Marty and rusty. And and not only that too, but in real life as well, you see this in a lot of true crime where people are constantly looking for the most weird, elaborate explanation for mysteries, you know, to the exclusion of what is most often the most likely answer. The boyfriend did it. The husband did it. You know, person committed suicide and the body just hasn't been found. Um, so I like that it didn't do that, but I felt like they could have done it in a way that still left at least a little ambiguity that left, um, that didn't give us a, a, what felt like a 20 minute exposition dump and didn't contour all the things. I mean, we, I, I think it kind of became obvious once you realized that the pink room was in the Hoyt mansion that they had kidnapped her. Yeah. So, you know, you we were already kind of there. They didn't need to tell us that and let us still have our imaginations. Let us still play around the corners and the edges of it to fill it in as as we see fit. And I think that would help keep up the atmosphere better. So, so what I would say is, I, I guess I do actually kind of agree with you, but it's going to come up with something that they did later that I think should have been the ambiguous parts, not the actual crime and what happened with the children. You mentioned, too, another portion of, uh, of the story that was an exposition dump is when Mahershala Ali comes to the realization in 2015 of what has actually happened to Julie. She, he finds the passage in the book. He has the vision of his wife. And then figures out that uh, Julie is, is still alive and is with the, the little boy that missed her 
from when she was abducted and who happened to also be the gardener at the end and then goes goes to visit her on any level did that that scene work for you of him figuring it out that specific scene did not that he figured it out actually did work for me and this gets to another complaint i had with execution um in that i think what would have been a much better way to go is is the following when he is um picking up his daughter was it judy or it was the same as the mom's name um anyway they're Lucy. at the convent and you know the two old detectives run into the little girl and then they see her dad and he gets in a car that has his business name which is a droin or ad iron i a droin i should have written this down but any rate his name is on the side it's the it's car. ardoin a-r-d-o-i-n yeah ardoin now, first off, this was a hole because I would think that the detectives would have seen that and that, hey, wait a minute, wasn't there a really big part of our case involving a kid named Ardnoin? Um, it wasn't a part of the case, though. Yeah, because he was the kid they were supposed to be hanging out with and was... Oh, yeah, but I feel like that's more of a side note in a police report. And having you and I have both spent enough time reading about different crew crimes, true crime stories to find how many little details like that they never are able to connect even if it's just two different detectives reading two different reports that don't sure. have it. Okay. I, I think that's excusable. All right. But even still, so we now we know, even if they don't comment on it, we know that he's seen the last name. Okay. So then he goes to his house and without the, the, the hallucination of Amelia, he just makes a phone call and he says, Hey, I'm looking up this landscape company and you don't explain it to the audience exactly why he's doing it, but then he drives out to the house and then this woman who could be Julie comes out. And I, I think then you would have had eagle eyed viewers could have pieced it together. There still would be some ambiguity, but I, I think that would have been a better way as opposed to just another exhibition dump after we've already had one. So I'm okay with the actual scene that happens. The re you know, with, with her appearing, I, I mean, it is insanely coincidental that the book he's never read falls open to the exact page he needs in order to put it all together. But I'm okay with her coming and telling him that because I think in his his dementia mind, that could be a way that he actually works it out is in her voice and in her presence, even though it's his own mind figuring it out. I think it would have been better leaving it just at that and not having him physically go to Lucy or to going to Julie, Julie's house and having her see it and having us know for sure that, yep, it is Julie. Everything worked out for her. Just the thought that maybe this could have happened to Julie. Maybe the nuns did lie. Maybe it was a fake grave or maybe it's not. Maybe she did end up having a horrible life and maybe she got a happy life. I think that's where they could have left the ambiguity. And I think that would have been more interesting for the listeners, but still been a satisfying way to wrap up their stories and maybe cut out an ending for you. I think there are a lot of people who may have liked the moment where he is with Julie at her house and he's kind of dementia, but then he takes that glass of water and he has that kind of pause where he stares at her, where he seems to have recognition so that mm -hmm. maybe he does know this is actually wrapped up and he can move on and forget about it and, and try and finish out his life happy with his, his grandkids and his kids. But I personally, as a viewer didn't need that moment. I think you could have just had him go off to be with his kids after kind of having a, a dementia moment where maybe he figured out the case and maybe he didn't and leave that to the, the viewer. See, and I, I actually agree with all of that. I just, I liked that scene and I would have liked for the show to have trusted us a little more to have figured that out on our own without having the the info dump from from Ghost Wife. So but before we jump into Amelia and Hayes and the resolution of their relationship, I just want to take a, a side note to go on the detour that was West, the origin story of West finding a family for himself. Uh, I absolutely, that might be my favorite mo moment in the whole show, him getting his mm -hmm. ass kicked on purpose in a biker bar and then meeting a puppy and... Now yeah. he has a million puppies at his house. That's not a moment you expect in a true detective series. No, and I, no. I loved it. I ate it up. Yeah, no, it was, it was absolutely terrific. And I think it, it really, um, it, it really gave us more insight 
than we got from the previous seven episodes into him. I always felt he was a little bit of a cipher. Uh, uh, you weren't sure where he was really coming down on things. You know, is he is he on Hayes' side and really wants to figure out the case, or is he a company man? Um, he, he didn't get... I, I think Stephen Dorff did a great job with what he was given, but I don't think the character was really sketched out um, very well, other than in that scene and the brief scenes with Tom Purcell. Yeah. Um, well, and I the few times that the character really came to the forefront and he really got something. The rest of it, he felt like he was more there for plot device. And I kind of felt, I mentioned this before, I kind of felt he was, I was, I felt like they were setting him up as, and I know you didn't think he was set up as a great guy, but he was set up as nicer than I thought he was going to be. So I kept waiting each episode for him to turn, for him to have a deep, dark secret, for him to be involved in this somehow. And obviously he does some very bad things in this, but as far as the characters in this story go, he's one of the good guys. So I was I was very relieved to actually have him have um, a happy ending of this. I think Stephen Dorff, who isn't someone I particularly dislike, but isn't someone I particularly think much of either, exceeded all expectations I had for being cast. I think he did will, really well with this role, and it's 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 a credit to him. Yeah, absolutely. He he was fantastic, and I am actually anxiously looking forward to him being in more things. Hopefully now. So next, the the final big resolution we have is finding out what happened between Amelia and Hayes, what their relationship is based on. We see them almost break up. She writing things is the reason that he is basically put into isolation in the police force in 1980. And then we find out that, you know, in 2010 or whenever that is that she goes to college or whenever that fourth timeline is that they seem really happy that she probably just passed of natural causes or whatever and is gone in 2015, but it appears they had a really great relationship for it. And the results of that is that they spent the first 10 years of their life being connected basically only by this grisly murder. And once they finally were able to separate that and find themselves, they were able to have a real resolution and a real happy relationship moving forward. So it was interesting. Definitely not something I thought was coming. I thought it was going to be a lot darker tone than that. And I, I was, again, happy with how it happened, not happy with the execution, as you brought up, which is a series of monologues of them just sitting sitting in different restaurants and talking. I, I'm not going to present a way I would have liked this to have played out differently in this particular episode, because I don't have one. But the way they went through it felt felt rushed and not as satisfying as that happy ending to me should have felt. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think... Ultimately, for me, it gets to the heart of what my problem is with this season. And and I, I did like this season. I, Despite everything I've said, I will probably watch it again at some point. Um, but I feel like, well, there's the usual pacing problems and that True Detective always has and the fact that it was eight episodes when I think six probably would have been fine. But I also feel like they never quite decided which story they wanted to tell. Are they telling the story of this crime in this you know, gothic setting and, you know, it's true crime, you know, like, like season one essentially was, or are they telling the story of this man and his relationships and how they've progressed and, you know, what's happened to him as a result of dementia. Um, and, and so because they couldn't decide which of those two stories they wanted to tell, they kept pinging back and forth between them, stretching them out in order to fill the allotted time, and then just kind of running out of time at the end and sort of just having to dump it all out there at once. And as a result, neither felt particularly satisfying to me in the, the way it was wrapped up, in the amount of time it was given, in how it was paced, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it also harkens back to our often talked about point that Pizzolatto does not know how to write for women. And I never felt like I was supposed to feel for Amelia. Hayes obviously isn't a perfect character either, but you at least get to find out some of his motivations, some of his tortures throughout the course of the season. So he is a more likable character as the season goes on, where for her, she's basically until this episode presented as only caring about the story, using him 
etc to get what she can out of him it never felt like a loving relationship until the very last episode and you can't make me dislike a character for seven episodes and then have a 15 minute monologue that cures that i mean it's you know it's it's very rare that that type of thing can happen and they they weren't able to pull it off for me in this and it's disappointing because i think if they would have had a more rounded Amelia throughout the course of the series that could have been a much more powerful moment when we finally figure out how they basically figured out to live and love each other. Right. Well, especially too, when you've spent the previous seven episodes establishing that there really isn't anything good in their relationship. Uh, there, there weren't, you know, the loving asides that, or, you know, the tender moments that would make me think, Hey, these are two people who would want to give it another try. Yeah. Who would want to to work on it? That I, I would have thought they would both been too broken and too badly damaged at that point to have even considered wanting to do it. So yeah, that didn't feel earned that those two characters would try. Yep, yep. So my final kind of random thoughts that I want to throw in there because this this really really bothered me is they have a scene where Hayes and West are driving in a car, and as the camera kind of pins around and rotates, it keeps changing what generation they are of them so it's the all four all three of three of the main timelines kind of converging over and over man that was so on the nose i i almost started fast forwarding because i couldn't take it and it felt like it kept going not only was it just like so on the nose and hammering a point into our faces it was a really bad green screen it looked like the exaggerated sin city type driving a car you know only with color i was actually kind of embarrassed for it and you know, they threw in a lot of subtle, like there's a moment where they're walking down the hallway and there's a mirror on the floor and you see young Hayes, even though it's old Hayes walking through, they've had several of those minute moments that are a little more subtle, but man, there was some stuff that was just like blatant in your face. We're not even going to bother with subtlety in this. The same with the, the murder she wrote sequence we talked about mm-hmm. to start the show. I, I looked this up. I wanted to look up who directed this and I, I haven't had a chance because it was a different director, Pizzolatto has done a few of them, and there's been a few different directors this season. But, man, this is the worst directed episode that I have seen, maybe of this entire series, and that includes episode two. And and the guy who did it did do four other episodes, or three other episodes, and I didn't notice it. But, man, I was really let down by some of that stuff. So that's yeah. my weird random thought of the uh, of the show as we kind of close to an end. Do you have any other random thoughts before I ask you the one big final question? Um. Yeah, my my random thought was that having Michael Roker be um, Big Daddy Hoyt, to me, pretty much guarantees they're going to be a season four. Because you don't get an actor that big with the kind of money he probably commands and then throw him in for basically this one-off scene that ultimately isn't even that important to the narrative uh, and not have him already locked in for something going forward. Um I I feel like they're going to do a season four where they're going to try now that we know this all happens in the same universe, right? Season four is really going to try and bring back the, the central mystery of season one, the the kind of grand pedophile conspiracy thing. And I think he's going to wind up being a big character in it. That was, that was the very first note I had uh, about it was like, you don't, you don't get a guy like that in for this nothing scene with nothing further planned for it. Well, see, and I think you do. And the reason I think you do is because I think that whole sequence is a giant bait and switch about what this episode was really about. So I I think that was an intentionally done thing to make you think, oh, giant major conspiracy. We're going to be unraveling this for the entirety of 80 minutes. And then it's just over. I think that was a tactical, you know, or a a tactic. That was a tactic used just to elicit one type of emotion from the viewers and then to switch, switch it out from under them. So I think that's where they're going. And I'll be quite honest with you. Even if you are right, if this now becomes part of a bigger pedophile ring, I am really disappointed. Because I think oh, that yeah. ruins. Oh no, yeah, so am I. Um, I'm I'm not saying that I I'm, I'm happy about it, but and also too, I, I guess it could be because my theory had been the one essentially cribbed from Smithers oh, was the one that it turned out to be. I didn't really buy it as a bait and switch because I thought, oh yeah, the dad, of course, he's going to be protecting his daughter who kidnapped a kid to raise in her basement. Um, it didn't it didn't strike me as as being tricky so maybe i was 
looking for something more than was actually there. But I'm 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 calling my shot now. Season four, he's going to be a big part of it in some way or another. All right, and that 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 was actually kind of what my next question was going to be: is is what do you think they're going to do with uh, a season four? You've laid out what you think they're going to do. What do you want them to do in a season four? What do I want in a season four? Why don't you Why don't you think about that a second, and I'll give you mine because I obviously didn't right. prep you, so I I already have mine. I think one of the very cool things about True Detective is just the atmosphere and the land, the massive landscape shots you get of these kind of exotic locales throughout the the U.S. Even even when they were doing an L.A. based one, I thought they found an interesting way to film L.A. So we, I don't think you, I don't want anything that really they can be in the same universe, but I don't really want the story to connect. So I want this to be some type of mystery in Maine. I want this to be a winter mystery in a, a snow snow landscape, and I want Michael Keaton as your main go to in this next series, Wh- whatever the, the mystery will be, but keep it to eight episodes, maybe tease the larger universe, but I never want these stories to actually overlap. Okay. Well, I totally agree with that. I don't want the stories to actually overlap. I, I fear that's where it's going. I don't want that. I don't know that I've got a, a particular location in mind or an actor in mind. What I do think is that it should be six episodes. I think they need to do a better job practicing economy of story. And that only gets harder as shows get more popular and further out because they're given more leeway from their networks and they're given more money. And so there's a tendency to spend it. But I I think even with just six episodes, season one could feel stretched at times. And this one really felt stretched. Um, I I want them to... uh, as great as some of the character stuff was in this, I want it to be mystery focused. I, I don't want these two massively competing plots fighting for airtime. Um, I, I don't watch True Detective to get an in depth examination of a marriage. No matter how well it's done, that's not why I'm tuning in. I'm tuning in for a moody, atmospheric horror mystery. And any other relationships that are in there, I want it to serve that plot. And so um, I would be down with Maine. Nice. Well, that is going to do it for this edition. We want to thank you for taking this ride with us on this season of True Detective. We appreciate everyone listening. More people have listened to this than anything else we've ever done. So thank you for that. You are always welcome to hit like, subscribe, leave a comment. We will be back next week, obviously not with True Detective, but we'll be reviewing some other stuff. We have enjoyed doing the HBO stuff. We're looking forward to Watchmen coming out and some of the other shows that are going to be hitting there. So we will be back in the not too distant future. Keep a lookout for us and thanks for listening. See ya. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.